Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first in what I hope is many videos on the channel here, focusing on the book that I have been crafting behind the scenes. Don't worry if you're not here for that and you don't care, it'll by no means become the majority of the content on the channel. This is just a side project I've had going on behind the scenes for quite some time, and I want to occasionally show my audience who I'm super proud of something else I'm really proud of and get feedback and get input and potential hype for my attempt at joining the ranks of these authors that I admire and love so much. So in this video here, we're going to be diving on deep into the first of two magic systems that will be populating the world I'm building. If you want to see more about this world, I've been kind of trickling bits and pieces to my Patreon. There's even like audio recordings from Murphy Napier reading a short story that takes place in the world. I have a few short stories, in fact, that are up that all take place in this world. And also an audio recording from my brother. So those of you who love that ad spot with him a while back, you can get more of my brother and him read one of my short stories as well. But without much further ado, I want to go ahead and tell you about the first magic system here, which is the harder of the two. Yes, I'm going full Wheel of Time style here and having a harder versus softer magic system at play. But you will notice that there is a very core element to me explaining this magic system to you here that is missing, and that is the lore behind it. I'm keeping lore rather close to the chest for a while, especially in development of this project, because well, it is finally shifting from something that's feeling like a pipe dream that'll never come true to, oh no, it's a reality, hence why I'm comfortable enough sharing it with you. I don't necessarily want to release those details because I want to have the flexibility to still maybe manipulate the lore a bit as I'm figuring out exactly how this story is going to come to a conclusion. So yes, the things that are for sure and done will potentially be trickled out to you in videos or for sure put on Patreon. The lore, lore and major plot details, yeah, those are, those are gonna be close to the chest for a while. Let's go ahead and discuss Grohaland, or as it's commonly known, gripping. Grohaland is the ability to telekinetically grab and exert force onto any non-living object or material, a push-pull mechanic with energy derived from an internal source called the Grohaland. Basic use of gripping involves the wielder pushing and pulling from their own person, limiting the amount of weight they can handle before the pushback on themselves becomes too great. Now, that seems like a fairly standard telekinetic mechanic, and that's where I wanted to kind of grow from. The main philosophy here for me was I want to have something basic that I can then layer these interesting angles on top of. One of the first real interesting subversions from your typical telekinetic powers that we've seen in everything from the Force in Star Wars to Cosmere's Allomancy is tying. So more advanced grippers have discovered ways to link the energy they wield to objects outside themselves. This ability, known as tying, allows them to grip objects to one another, nullifying their own weight limitations. While extremely beneficial for any gripper to learn, the practice of tying is mastered by few. So a pretty straightforward example of this would be you are standing in a street. There's a brick wall in front of you you desperately want to get through because some dastardly villain has taken the woman you love, right? So you want to get through that wall. Well, you don't necessarily have the physical mass to push this wall over with your body. That would cause quite the problem. So what you could do instead is tie it off. You would essentially tie the telekinetic weight instead of being from you to a boulder. You then input the energy from the grow to exert force from the boulder's mass into that of the wall, causing the wall to topple over. Dun 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 dun! You can save your significant other who is being held by, you know, evil bad people. Now, the immediate question comes into play when you're handling telekinetic abilities as a writer are what are the limitations? Because theoretically, with no limits, someone with telekinetic abilities could just pull the sun into the earth no story, we're all dead. I've already established one limitation, right? With the weight issue. Even if you can tie it off to something with great mass, there's only so much mass available in any given sight line. And if you try to just tie everything to the earth, you can only shoot things upwards. Well, I'm going to add another limitation on top there because I don't necessarily want people to be able to just endlessly push on things and their only limitation to be, well, there's not a big enough rock around, right? That's kind of boring. And that is where the burn comes into play. Grips must operate with an extreme level of care. While seizing or gripping an object with their power, grips trigger an internal burn rate, which varies according to the power of the gripper. The longer the gripper uses their ability, the hotter that internal burn becomes. As a result, 
Grips prefer to utilize great force quickly at a lower cost to themselves rather than get dragged into longer drawn out combat. Users must stay within their burn rates or they will face dire costs. And those costs are my favorite part of what I've developed here because the green is there for a reason. I developed these costs, the side effects of using this magic system while watching the TV show Chernobyl, which if you haven't watched on HBO is outstanding. But yes, radiation sickness has inspired these costs of using the Groholind or gripping. Burning or exerting excessive force while gripping is extremely dangerous to the user and potentially those around him. So to summarize what was just said, if someone's just doing extremely small tasks, there's like a flick of flame inside them. There's no real cost. The burn is minimal, but the longer it's dragged out, even at lower levels, the greater the consequences for what they're doing. So let's go over those consequences for someone who's burning at a weak level, a stronger level, or igniting. Someone who is weakly burning for an extended period of time will immediately begin suffering from nausea, possible vomiting, headache, fever, dizziness, extreme fatigue, or a drop in blood pressure. A delayed result may be diarrhea, risk of illness such as infection, excessive sleep, and aching pain. Now, those are just for people who are burning for extended period of times at lower levels. Let's look at for extended period of times for stronger levels. A stronger burn may result in vomiting blood, loss of consciousness, internal bleeding and aching pain. The delayed results would be hair loss, bloody diuretic stool, crippling pain, and possible death. And then, of course, with every good magic system, there is the using it to its most extreme, the I don't care about my life anymore and are having my giant heroic thrust, which I don't even have in any of my story yet, but definitely exists within the world. That is called igniting. And here are the side effects of igniting. The immediate result is hematridosis, or in layman's terms, sweating blood and death. The delayed result would be an accelerated decay of one's corpse. Now you can see I'm having some creative liberties with the results of radiation poisoning. Now it's important to note that each grip will reach these levels at different rates. One grip or someone who's using these abilities might be able to lift and throw several men around a room for minutes at a time while never burning beyond a weak point. Such use might cause another to fully ignite. It's really going to depend on the individual. Obviously, people with greater mass have certain benefits due to the weight limitations here, but there is just an innate ability in some to have a stronger potential with the Groholind. Range also decreases the effectiveness of a grip's burn, costing them more the further away the target is. Pretty standard. If it's further away, you got to exert more energy to get to it. There is a finite amount of Groholind each grip can use before the toxins within them build up to the point where no amount of cooldown can solve the problem. And of course, now we need to get into that cooling down. How long after someone does some burning do they need to wait before it's almost reset? Well, the truth is you can never fully reset. Everyone here is a wick burning to their end. How long a gripper needs to cool down or reset their burn is dependent on how long they were burning. This cool down rate is also somewhat inconsistent between grips. Many have observed that larger grips tend to be able to burn hotter for longer with lesser consequences, but even that is not a foolproof method of judging the needed cool down the grip's abilities. If a grip is in a desperate situation where they must continue to burn their powers, they can extinguish, resulting in a bleed. When a grip extinguishes, they are completely cutting themselves off from their ability to use the Grahalind for several minutes. During that time, the process of bleeding begins. Bleeding is the leaking of the internal toxin of the Groholand out into the environment around the gripper. Those in the vicinity of the release can be severely affected. The radius of the toxin is proportional to the amount of power the gripper has been using up until that point. After draining, the gripper will not be completely reset in their burn rate, but they will be at a substantially better position than before they let out their bleed, the cost of which is the health of those in the vicinity of the grip. So this is essentially like, okay, this person has built up all this energy. They are containing it within themselves and the burn is so bright. They have an unbelievable amount of power they need to let out because that burn has grown to such an extreme point. So they finally do. They can't let it cool down, just let it burn off by not using their power anymore. They're in a desperate situation. They need to keep the burn going. So they completely smite it by letting it all out, letting the energy just invade the world around them. Specifically, I came up with this in the scene in Chernobyl where I saw firefighters standing next to the exposed 
radioactive core. And that's going to be the ramifications for those who are unfortunate enough to be around someone who is at a point where they are forced to utilize this method. Now, there's obviously a weaponization aspect here as well. If someone wants to just demolish an entire section of the enemy's force, get someone to the point where they can do this to a great extent and send them off. Obviously a weaker grip, not gonna have a whole lot of this coming off them. They'll maybe just infest a few yards and those within will have mild symptoms. But if you have an extremely powerful grip who has fully overloaded himself and is in the middle of the enemy army or just maybe even in a city you want to no longer be habitable, go let them do their thing. But I wanna make it absolutely clear, there's a finite amount of this energy people can burn, period, even if they give themselves great cooldowns between usages before everything builds up to a point where there is no recovery. This is a continual sickness. The people who are experiencing this are not healthy, happy, strong individuals. Grips are miserable. They are succumbing to all kinds of issues and especially because they're typically around each other and grips are just leaking this energy in small amounts constantly, there's not a long lifespan there. Now I'd like to go over a few quirks that are just things I've noted from this magic system that are definite results and things I plan on including into the story. All of those who wield the Groheland inevitably have their eyes change either a neon green or yellow color which will even glow in the dark. While grips cannot grab living beings, they often subvert this limitation in combat by grabbing others' clothing or even hair. Many who live near grips for long periods of time report many strange side effects in themselves. The effect of burning seems to leak from grips even if they have not drained or bled out the energy. This has resulted in the temples in which the Grahaland is taught to be largely removed from society. The most notable sign someone is actively utilizing the Grahaland in your presence is an overwhelming metallic taste. If a grip has burnt to the point where a cooldown may take weeks or even months, many venture into remote locations where they can extinguish without the risk of harming any nearby. So that is the raw data of a magic system I have crafted so far. I have completely removed all the lore elements here. Those are again, as I've said, gonna be still kept up my sleeves, but I'm very interested in your feedback. I think the core of it is rather simple. Telekinesis has been done in fiction thousands of times, but I've wanted to just have something simple like that, and then you layer on top a whole lot of consequences, which I felt were fairly original, fairly new, and I like that those consequences themselves could inherently be a weapon. Hello, and welcome to your first ever episode of Daniel Tries to Graphically Over-Explain a Point because he's nervous some people are gonna misinterpret things about his magic system. And in today's episode, I am going to use fire to really demonstrate to you how all of this is going to work within the text, the narrative I am writing. And I just feel the need to say this, do not play with fire at home. I'm a trained guy, so I know what I'm doing here. <laughs> I'm not gonna be doing anything crazy dangerous, but seriously, especially if you're a kid watching this, don't do this at home. Don't be dumb. So something in this video that I've touched on that I feel needs a little bit more explaining is exactly how these costs are going to work. I touched on weak, strong versus igniting. Igniting basically meaning you commit suicide trying to do something too extreme for your body to handle. And as you get older, as you use this power more and more, instead of becoming stronger, you are more vulnerable to these more severe effects. Think of it this way. If I have a candle, I can take a flame to it and overall, it's not really gonna harm the candle much. But even if I take a larger flame and don't overdo it, not that big a deal. The larger flame in this instance being a greater exertion of force from someone who can use gripping. Really the point I'm trying to hit home here is that briefly using gripping has very little damage to the user at all. Just how you can take a flame and as long as you quickly move it over something, nothing really happens. We all know the party trick where you can basically put your hands through flame and it doesn't hurt you. Over time, while well, you may be more experienced to become a little bit of a larger candle with multiple wicks, you can do more things, you have more power at your disposal, you've also drained. This is a pretty empty candle. It's getting down to just its core roots and every little bit of fire in there is going to do exponentially more damage in terms of the reserves left. There's a finite amount at this person's disposal. And let's say this person who has a lot of experience starts burning at the max capacity they can without directly committing suicide. You start to see the candle's gonna be dripping away fast. There's not a whole lot left 
for it to pull from. Now this person who has just burnt really hard doesn't want to deal with the ramifications of all these toxins inside of them. Now, if I just put this cap on, the smoke would build up, the inside would get greasier, AKA the side effects we mentioned before. But instead, this person can extinguish and drain and the smoke comes out, affecting everyone in the area. Anyone in this room right now can now smell this disgusting smoke. And that's not exactly pleasant. Amplify that to be the radiation sickness that I was inspired from for the side effects of my magic system. That's warm on its base. So there's two real factors here in terms of the cost benefit analysis of using Grohalind or gripping in combat or daily life. Really, you can do small things with no cost to you in the long run. Even just a brief blip of flame on a candle has zero effect. But anything that's a bit larger, even the small amount can have some effect. Sticking your hand in front of a flamethrower even for a half a second will have a cost. So yeah, you need to be careful how often you burn big flames. And then finally, there's a long-term buildup problem, the toxins living in your body, becoming more severe as you get older. They play off each other in what I feel is a nice push back and forth. We're gonna end the playing with fire now. I hope this explained my ramifications and how they play out to you in a more beneficiary manner. Back to the desk and green screen. So I'm very excited and admittedly nervous for your feedback. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. Like and subscribe if you have not already or you are really interested to see where this book, this story I'm crafting continues on and the second magic system, which I hope to have a video out here for fairly soon. And join the Patreon if you'd like to see the more behind the scenes stuff I have leaking on out. Have a good one, y'all. Peace.